by the way for this material i have referred to another good book by dietel on c++ for programmers the book is actually meant as an advanced study for those who have already done a first course in programming in fact usually in iit also we would usually have an object oriented programming course or a lab even for computer science students in their second year so consequently please take this discussion as an elementary introduction to the notion of objects most of the programming nowadays actually happens using object oriented programming concepts primarily because of the rich features that it provides for building very large applications information hiding is something that we briefly saw there is a notion of inheritance where you could have a class a sub class a sub sub class where a sub class inherits properties of the major class let me just spend 2 minutes in explaining that notion so if you take a person as a class for example some of the attributes of the person which can be defined universally for any object which is a person can be done at this level itself for example the name of the person the date of birth address and in the context of other project for example fingerprints these could easily be the member data elements of every object which belongs to the class person now usually you might define additional classes which are populated by objects which are persons but they have some special attributes a clear case is that of a student if you were to list the attributes for a student independently you will find the student also has a name student also has a date of birth student also has an address student also has a fingerprint but additionally the student has roll number the student has hostel number the student has room number the student has cpi now some of these things will become attributes of an object only if that object is a student in iit kind of setting where you have cpi if the student is a university student he or she might have marks the point being here is that once i have defined a class called person then is it necessary for me to redefine all those attributes for a student which are already there as part of the definition of my class for persons if i could somehow say that the student class is not really a completely independent class but is a sub class of person in the context of programming this kind of modeling facilitates a huge amount of reuse of whatever i have already defined for the parent class for example all the data elements which form attributes of the super class are inherited by every sub class member so consequently i define these attributes maybe certain functions member functions of this class which will let's say set date of birth set address capture fingerprint all of these methods or functions as we call the member functions in c++ can be defined for the person class roughly in the way that we described yesterday but once they are defined here they automatically are inherited by a sub class consequently if we just say without defining anything that student is a sub class of the class of persons then every member element data element which is an attribute of person 
automatically becomes an attributor student. Every member function of the class person becomes a member function of student. This property is called inheritance. Just like traditionally children inherit properties of their parents genetically. Similarly, subclasses inherit properties of the classes. Now, every subclass could have a few attributes and a few functions which are peculiar to that subclass. Obviously, otherwise we would need a subclass if everything was same. It is those additional attributes and functions that we need to define for this new subclass. So, for example, if we define student as a subclass of person, then we only need to define for the student those attribute values such as role number, hostel, room, CPR, which are different from the attributes of the main class. Similarly, any additional function, which for example could calculate CPR, which could allocate a hostel number, room number, etc., or change room number, hostel number, need to become member functions of this subclass. Calculation of CPI would be a function which will belong strictly to this subclass. It will not be available to objects of the class person, obviously, because they are defined in the part. So a subclass inherits attributes and member functions of the parent class, but not the vice versa. Additionally, there is a provision. There might be a feature, for example, that you want to redefine differently in a subclass. Consider this, as far as IIT campus is concerned, hostel and room constitutes the address of the student. Now even if the address of a person is defined differently, this address is defined different. I have two choices. Either I can treat this address as the address of the original of the student and call this as current address. Ultimately, I may redefine the address itself here. If any attribute is redefined in the subclass, then that redefinition holds. The original definition is not inherited. Exactly the same thing happens for functions. If you were to rewrite a function with the same name that you have originally written for the member members of this class here, then the rewritten function holds for the subclass. So class and subclass are extremely powerful programming paradigms. On one hand, they permit you to inherit properties of the parent class automatically. You can see how much reduction you will have in writing your programs. Everything that you have defined for person is automatically assumed to be defined for student. On the other hand, if you wish to change something, you of course will define additional attributes and additional functions which are required for the student subclass. But if you were to reuse any function with the same meaning that was defined for person, you can do that. If you want to reuse it with a different meaning, then you can re-implement that function or redefine even a data element, in which case the new definitions will hold as far as objects of this class are concerned. Objects do not fall from sky. Consider a variable, for example. A variable is brought into life in your program when you declare that variable. So for example, when you say int count, that is the time when compiler allocates memory to count, that is the time when compiler decides that this count will hold an integer value in an internal format, binary or whatever. Subsequently, wherever you use count, this will be typically an initialization statement. The scope of count is defined to be the entire program. When does count disappear from the scene? The count disappears from the scene automatically when you say return zero and close this. So when the program exits, it is the operating system actually which cleans up all the memory that has been allocated to this particular program. In the process, the count is wiped out. 
So just as a variable comes into an existence only when the program is executed because the compiler has said allocate memory to this. So when you load the program, at that time the count comes into existence and when you finish execution of the program, the count disappears. The scope of count is the entire definition of count. We have already seen for simple variables in our programming language. We could, for example, define say int j, int j also is brought into existence by the compiler, but this j will have a scope only up to the curly brass which closes this curly brass. Because the scope of this definition is just the false statement. Consequently, elsewhere in the program, if you have said j is equal to 25, and subsequent to this for loop, if you say C out J. Independent of what was the value of J inside here, the value that will be printed will be 25. Because outside this for loop, there exists another variable of the same name J, it has been brought into existence. Consequently, there are two J's for some time during the execution of your program. There is a J here which is kept separately, a new J is created here, allocated memory. It is handled inside, but when you quit, j, this j disappears. This kind of scoping is important to understand, and that is the reason why when you write large programs where same named variables can be used by different people for different purposes, it is important to limit the scope of local variables in this fashion. This is an extreme example where you limit the scope of your local variable to a body of a loop, but in general, the scope should be contained within the program segment or function segment that you write. Unless, of course, you require certain variables to be known globally. In which case, you will define them as global or static variables. Why I repeat this notion is because in objects exactly something similar happens. An object has private data members which are not known to outside the object. Those values cannot be touched. So any variable names that you use to define private variables of an object cannot be modified externally, cannot be modified externally. Only the methods which work on that object, which are the member functions of that object, can modify them. Similarly, the object itself is brought into existence only when it is defined. An object class definition is different from an object definition. An object class definition usually happens in some header file, just like your dot .h files in the conventional program. Yesterday we saw an example, we shall see one more example of extension of the same thing here. Similarly, the member functions which are defined in the class will operate upon any object of that class. As a matter of fact, if you see C out, if you see C in, these are nothing but the member functions of special class called stream class. And these are called operators. This is called an insertion operator for the member class, uh, for the member function. And member functions are invoked in one of the two methods by either putting a point, this is what we have been using, there is an additional convention called an arrow which you use in case the object is referred to by a pointer rather than the object name itself. So whenever you have the object name, you use dot convention to invoke any function. Uh, belonging to that object. Let us look at some of these things here. We'll begin with looking at a preprocessor directive which is quite important. We have seen some preprocessor directives earlier. We'll see one more in the context of the class. There is a notion of creator and destructor of the class. And there is a notion of private and public properties of the class. We shall briefly see them again. The basic theme is you should separate interface and inter-implementation. 
So you may implement a particular member function in a peculiar way that you want, but that should be hidden from the users of that function who should be familiar only with the interface. Very roughly, this corresponds to prototype definition of functions that we have seen earlier in our conventional program. So a prototype definition of function hides all details about implementation. It just tells you how that function is to be invoked. And anybody can invoke that function as long as that function is included during compilation and linking process. Just like functions could be separately put in a separate file, could be compiled and kept in a compiled version, similarly object classes could also be defined in separate files, could be compiled and kept ready separately, which means not only the class names, but class attributes and class member functions are automatically available for your program. That is how object libraries are created, much like the function libraries in the conventional programming. As a matter of fact, without knowing explicitly so, we have been using all standard object libraries. All C++ standard libraries, when you say using namespace std for example, or when you say include fstream or include string, what you are doing actually is you are invoking, you are telling the compiler, go back to the previously compiled object classes, member functions, member attributes, everything, everything, and please make them available to me. The reason why your programs are not very large is because huge amount of coding has already been done as part of these member functions of standard classes. No modern software system can be developed without strong backing from such existing libraries. Many of the domain specific libraries are proprietary. For example, if you see the fingerprinting kind of environment, there are many people who manufacture devices, but they hide their member functions of the classes which they define. They don't make those libraries available. However, some of the libraries are mandatorily made available. For example, in our case, the program that you execute in the lab to capture the fingerprint could not have been written unless the interfaces were made available by the manufacturer of those devices. Of course, the way they had documented it was so short, it was not like the standard C++ library. That is why it took some time to construct a program which can capture fingerprint, give you a file, and that file you can use wherever you want. But such is the case of developing large programs that you would necessarily need large libraries. For C++ specifically, there is a huge attempt to develop a very large open source library comprising of various domain specific components as well. It is expected that that library over the next decade will go further and will become the hallmark of any modern program. Let us look at this example. We have seen that object classes need to be defined. But what may happen in a group project is somebody may wrongly redefine an object class. Same definition. Two groups have agreed on the definition of object class, but it is not clear whose program code should contain that definition. So one group defines a dot h file, I also define a dot h file. In such case, how do we ensure that only one of them is used by the compiler? Because like your variables or arrays or functions, object classes can only be defined once. For this purpose, we use the compiler directive called if ifndef. If ifndef means if not defined. And the directive called define. Ordinarily, everybody will have hash define some name. This name is an arbitrary name, by the way. This is my choice. But it is a C++ convention that if you have a .h file, then you convert the name of that .h file into all capitals, convert the dot into underscore, and write a capital H instead of small h. So the file mytime.h, which will contain all of this, would actually have an artificial name, it's like a variable name, mytime underscore h. What different groups working on the same program must agree to is the definition of these names. So now it does not matter whether in my program I have used this my time underscore h and I have tried to define it and in somebody else's program in the same group, somebody else also does the same thing. So let's say both dot h files get included because of the include statements and your program gets compiled. The first one to occur sequentially is, let us say this, 
when this one is encountered, the compiler preprocessor, this is it's not compiled, it's preprocessing, it will come across this if and if. They will find out from its memory data structure whether anything called my time underscore h has been defined. It will notice, of course, that it is not defined because it is the first file it has picked up. Since it is not defined, it will execute everything that you state up to end if. You will recall if and end if statement that we have used for debugging purposes once. This is very similar. But if end if is a specific preprocessing uh, directive. So as I said, since my time underscore h has not been defined by anybody, when this particular file is preprocessed, all of this will be included for compilation. Now imagine there is another include file which contains exactly the same thing, which comes later in the sequence of all the files that you are pushing to the compiler. The preprocessor at that time will look at this, and when it cross checks, it will find now my time underscore h has already been defined. So since it has been defined, it will ignore that complete dot h file. Consequently, multiple definitions are prohibited automatically by this pre-compiler directive. Just to ensure that you always take care to do this, it is not uncommon amongst professional programmers to include if end if and end if in every dot h file that they write. Whether somebody else is going to write and read like that or not, it doesn't matter. Because they want to ensure that exactly one version is processed. Bottom line is, this prevents multiple definitions, which is a must. We'll again go back to using my time, which is a class that we had defined. So when I say include my time dot h, that entire definition of that class would get defined. We had defined that class yesterday. If you recall, that class had three parameters, or rather three attributes, hour, minutes, and seconds. And then we had defined certain functions to work on that class. Here, I am extending the definition to, uh, I am using that definition to include a main program which shows how the objects are used. So look at this for example, int main as usual. Now look at this place, my time t. My time is actually an object class. When I put the name my time, it is like a variable type, integer floating point. So I am trying to define an object of time type my type. So an object belonging to a class, this particular declaration is called instantiation. So I am instantiating objects. Just like I instantiate variables or arrays, similarly I have to instantiate objects. Objects do not fall from the sky as I mentioned. So in every program which tends to use any object, that object has to be defined and has to be informed to the compiler that this object belongs to this class. Once I say my time t, t automatically becomes an object of type my time. It inherits all the attributes that my time class has and it inherits all the member functions that my time has. So automatically all the member functions and attributes become the property of this object t which has been created here. Here is another example of instantiation. Wake up in bracket 6, 30, 0. This is equivalent to instantiating a variable with initial values. So just as you can say int count equal to 0, here I am saying int wake up in bracket 6, 30, 0. Since the user knows that there are three attributes, hour, minutes and seconds, which belong to a particular object of any class, then he is defining wake up time, for example, as 6 hours, 30 minutes, 0 seconds. Notice that as far as the user of these object class is concerned, the user need to know only the interface. The interface to object says there are three attributes and there are so many functions. As long as that is known, how exactly those functions are implemented need not be known at all. Here is a, another instantiation of 10 objects in the form of an array. So it is an array of 10 elements called t stamp or time stamp. So I could use this array for example to capture the time stamps of various activities. Let us say a student enrolls in the institute, I capture the time stamp. The student uh, goes to the hostel model, another time stamp. A time stamp is by the way a more generic term used in the information technology field 
to represent not just time in hours, minutes and seconds as we have defined it here, but more generically it is defined as date and time. So a time stamp actually is a unique combination of a, a four uh, byte integer number which represents date and a similar uh, uh, byte integer number which represents time. It is always stored in an internal format. So time stamp is usually an intrinsic element of any object library or any large function library that you write for processing data. I am just mentioning this to tell you that time stamp is a generic concept in programming. However, for our purposes, this T stamp declares 10 objects in an array of the class my time. So there are three types of definitions that you have seen. Definition equivalent to a simple variable, which is an object of this type. Definition of a simple variable with initial values, which is also an object of this type. Ten element array of objects, which are of the type my time. Here is another definition. Constant my time noon. This is again similar to the definition of constant variable. A constant is something whose value cannot be changed. So noon, for example, is a standard time. Noon is 12 o'clock. Noon does not change. I cannot assign a value 7 o'clock to noon because noon I want it to remain 12 o'clock. So I define it as const. So when I define const my time noon, 12 comma 0 comma 0, this defines a constant object. Because that has to be brought into existence by some definition like Finally, a variation or definition of an object is defining a pointer. My time start time pointer. Please note that when I define something like this, what is created is a pointer to that object. Pointer to some object of that class. There exists no object at this stage. So just as you can define in conventional programming pointers to integer, pointers to character, pointer to characteristic, etc. But there is no variable, there is no memory allocated at that point in time. There are two special functions available in C++. One is called a new and the other is called delete. The new one actually brings a object in existence and allocates its pointer to such a pointer value. And delete, of course, deletes the existence of that object. So pointer is a placeholder kind of thing. The pointer variable which is declared here, time PTR, will be able to hold a pointer to an object as and when an object is either created or as and when the pointer to an existing object is assigned to time PTR. It is possible, for example, to you, for you to say time pointer equal to star T. Because T is an existing object, from that point onward, time pointer will point to object called T. But pointer can be used to point to any one of the objects. I could even uh, assign it to say fifth element of T star. But I could always create a new object if I have a pointer placeholder for it. Here is how I will use the member functions which have been defined for the class my time. T dot print standard. Now this is a method or this is a function which is defined for the object class my time. All that it does is it present, it, it prints the values of time in the standard time format. Those of you who recall yesterday's discussion will remember that the standard time was printed as 12 noon really, not 00. zero. Observe that there was a clause which said that if hour is either 0 or 12, print it as 12. Otherwise, print it as between 0 to 12. That is my definition of define printing the time. Observe also that there are no parameters here. So what will it print really? Why there are no parameters? The reason there are no parameters is once I say object T, when the object was created, at the time of creation, the three attributes of that object were initialized to certain values. So when you instantiate an object, the object automatically gets constructed. And we shall see some example of construction. At the time of construction, initial values 
are assigned in case you have an initialization routine available. Otherwise, it is expected that you would have set values appropriately as we shall see later how do we set them. The point here is, when I say t dot print standard, the print standard function will be invoked and it will print the values of the three attributes which are not being passed to it, but because t itself is being invoked, the values belonging to the attributes of the t is what will get printed here. On the other hand, when I use a member function like set time, I am required to give parameter value. T dot set time, 13, 27, 6. What will this do? This will assign our minutes and seconds as 13, 27, and 6 to the object T. Consequently, if I invoke print standard now, it will print 1, 27, 6 pm. Remember that in the print time uh, function, uh, uh, print standard function, we were printing hours in 1 to 12 notation and we were adding AM or PM at the end of it. So that is how it will get printed. On the other hand, if I try to set time to 99, 99, 99, which is obviously an invalid time, you remember what will happen. The set time function was powerful enough to say that if any hour, minute or second specification exceeds the specified limit of 12, 60, 60, then it will be set to zero. Again, that was an arbitrary decision, that was my implementation decision. In a programming situation, you may want a different default value to be given. You may want an error message to be printed. You may want an error parameter to be passed to some other function. That is your choice of implement. The point being made is, when I use a function, I don't have to worry about how it has been implemented. As long as the results of implementation are well known to the people who are using that function. So in this case, as long as I document that set time is a function which will set appropriate time to the three attributes of time or in early when you supply those correct values. But if you supply incorrect values, I will reset that to 0, 0, 0. As long as that is understood, that is how the function is used. Here is another call, wake up dot set hour. Notice that yesterday we did not discuss set hour as a function. We have set time only as a function. So that is why I have said, what is this? In the next slide, I will elaborate how it is useful to further break down set time into set hour, set minute, set second. For example, it is quite likely that in a digital watch, which has a default wake up time of 6.30, Somebody wants to change only the hour. Let's say I am sleeping rather late tonight. So instead of 6.30, I want to wake up at 7.30. Now 30 is already there in my clock. I don't want to change it. So I just want to change 6 to 7. So what am I trying to do? I am trying to set only the hour. Originally, I would have to prescribe 7, 30, 0. Why should it be necessary? Why can't I set only hour? I could if I have a special function available which can set hour individually. So we shall see how this is done, but it is possible to have a function which sets only the hour and not the time. In this case, wake up, which is an object, I could not only use wake up dot set time to set the full time if I wanted to, but I could also use wake up dot set hour if I wanted to do that. Here is a file called mytime.cpp, which tries to define that class once again. I have not included the complete definition. I have included only portions of the definitions to illustrate the point that I am making. This colon colon notation is important to understand. This colon colon notation defines actually the class name here, my time. And as a part of this class name, it defines the constructor. So the constructor is the major function, my time, int h, int m, int s. Our minute seconds are three integers. Notice that the three attributes of the class are integer, integer, and integer. And only thing that is defined in this constructor is set type HMS. Notice that this constructor is not something that we have to execute explicitly. Whenever we define an object in our main program, automatically the constructor function is called. And whatever we have stated in the construction function will be executed. The construction function sets set time HMS is the construct. Why? 
my time set time integer h integer n integer s since i have used set time i am defining the set time here but this time i am defining set time in a different way yesterday what we saw we had actual code which was setting up h m n s instead now i invoke three other member function set hour set minute set seconds and finish that uh, function name so now i am defining a member function set time in terms of three additional member functions these are sub functions this is perfectly valid after this of course i must define each one of them for example i now define for the class my time a function set hour it is only one parameter integer hour this time it is defined properly with a code if hour is less than 0 or if hour there is greater than 24 set h to 0 else set h to hour so suppose somebody passes an hour which is uh, 15 it will be valid 2 will be valid 0 24 will be valid but minus 18 or 212 will be invalid so consequently this set hour takes care of setting the hour attribute of the object proper in exactly the same time i can have set minute set second etc the set and get functions are typically the names used for what we call access functions to the objects any time you define an object class you are expected to define these set and get functions set functions which will permit you to define various attributes of that object and get function we should permit you to access that attribute and maybe print it out or show it or assign it to something else or simply return the value of that attribute so this is an, a function called get hour get hour return h please note that this get hour is defined as a const function because it is not supposed to get any parameter no changes are going to be reflected inside the object because of execution of this step this statement is merely an access statement you have asked me to find out what is the current value of the attri a particular attribute of an object i am returning that it is not necessary to have only get hour get minute get second i could always say get time and write a function will return hour minute and second or it will return something else and it will print hour minute and second but in general it is advantages to have get and set functions which operate upon individual elements or individual components or some small subset of the components what is the purpose notice the difference between set time and set hour set time itself is defined as a combination of set hour set minute set second what is the advantage suppose tomorrow i change the implementation of set hour for example i want to set hour in a different fashion i don't have to change set time at all i don't have to change set minute i don't have to change set second this appears to be an artificial example because hour minute seconds and setting time are equally trivial activities but consider on the other hand you have a very major function as the initialization function or the constructor function and within that there are four or five different sub functions it is always better to write those four or five sub functions separately and invoke them in the uh, in the main, main function so that if later on if the implementation changes for any one of those functions the main function the main body of the object definition need not be changed at all this becomes vital in large projects as you would have experienced recall that in all the group projects that you have been doing for last two weeks a large amount of time must have been spent in communication in agreeing to certain things and very little time would have been spent on programming you would therefore like that whatever little time that is spent on programming is quality time that means you do not have to reinvest in that time again ever and that is the reason why this kind of partitioning is extremely useful when you build large software this is all i wanted to discuss i just a reminder yesterday there is a notification from somesekar which is slightly erroneous so i'm just correcting it please remember that as a group activity you have to submit a total of seven questions in two distinct submissions one submission which is test questions simple medium complex each question attempted by three students 
plus a correct answer for that question. That is the first submission. Each of these questions will be evaluated for two marks each, accounting for six marks. The quiz questions, which originally I had said five questions to be set by five teams, instead I have now allocated topics to each batch, and you have to set quiz questions on those topics only. I was told by some students that they have already set some quiz questions which are not on this topic. Sorry, that is sad. You, you have good experience that you have gained by this exercise, but you have to redo it and set questions in the allocated topic. So each lab batch has to set two questions in the elementary topic that has been allocated and two quiz questions in the advanced topic that has been allocated. Again, this work should be distributed equally. I am not going to insist on any diary report or something, but it is for the team leaders and the lab batch coordinators to ensure that every member of the lab batch actually participates in some or the other activity concerning this question. At the least, I would expect that all students of a batch are familiar with questions and answers for the quiz and test questions which have been set at least by that batch. Ordinarily, I would have expected people to become familiar with all the questions and answers. I will still do that on the submission date for this, by the way, is 16th. 16th is the last lecture, which is Monday. So before the lecture, the submission must occur. The lab batches, therefore, have to submit these as a deadline. Uh, the lecture on Monday is 11.30, right? So should we say midnight of Sunday then, or you would like morning of Monday? Okay, morning of Monday. Everybody always wants more time. Fine. So let us say 8 o'clock morning Monday. That is the deadline for this. I will issue a notification, but remember that. Uh, what I, will, I propose to do is the submission of these questions and answers of all the batches will be put together in a single document and will be made available on 16th night itself for all of you to look at, just for fun. We'll, of course, evaluate them separately. So that's all I wanted to say. Good luck for the remainder week to complete your projects and this exercise. We'll meet on 16th primarily to discuss the composition of NSEM paper and to remove any squeakers that we have about in semester marks and the total marks. Just one more announcement. Some students have met me and told me this and one student has written a long, long mail. In the mid-sem and the quiz papers, you have the opportunity to get your quiz papers re-looked at by the TS. But because this is final exam, people are worried whether they will ever get to see the final exam. Some people have said that they are confidential. Nothing of that sort. In fact, in the older days when I used to correct papers myself, I used to correct patient papers publicly. So a lot of people would come and see each other several and my job was made easier because students will find errors in somebody else's problem. We don't have that opportunity. The uh, exam timetable is set, I think it is 23rd, right? So 23rd morning is the exam. Papers will get corrected on 27th. And the paper correction will continue up to midnight of 27th because that is when my TAs are available. Now, I am required to submit the grades within 96 hours. So even if I make the papers available, I am physically not here on that weekend. But what I will do is I will keep the final exam papers with me. I will take special permission. Anybody who is interested can still look at the question paper. Suppose you don't have time and your exam is ending and you are going back home, doesn't matter, go back home. If you have a genuine worry that your paper has not got marks that it deserves, please apply for recheck. I will get that answer book here, and instead of retotaling, with you in front of me, I will personally go through any uh, problems that you have with this. Are you comfortable with this process then? Fine. Thank you so much.